Okay, uh, thanks so much for your interest in having me present today. Uh, I'm coming to you from Edmonton, known to the Plains Cree as a Miswichi Waskahagan, part of Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Metis people. I've had the privilege of making a life here on Treaty 6 land for the last 10 years, and I'm committed to living in relationship with the diverse Indigenous peoples who make this place home and who have connections to this place since time immemorial. Now today I wanted to talk about the opaque blue glass family. Uh, Delphite is perhaps the most well-known name in use by collectors to talk about blue opaque glass. Shalane, a name for a brighter robin's egg blue subset, is perhaps less well known, but there are lots of other names for the glass that goes, uh, that this color of glass goes by, and hence my title, Delphite, Shalane, and Friends. Before we dive in too deep, I wanted to introduce myself a bit, uh, since as it's been mentioned, I'm pretty new to glass facts. That's me standing outside the biggest antique mall in Western Canada here in Edmonton. And me with my husband, Ed, who's a little camera shy there. And there we're at Elk Island National Park about an hour east of Edmonton. Now my love for antiques and things vintage probably started with my parents who would drag me and my sister on treks to antique stores in the Ottawa Valley when we went on summer vacation as kids. Uh, and while I used to find antique stores dusty and boring, uh, I like to think that those trips and the antiques around our 1912 four square house gave me an appreciation for my adult years. If I had to set a start point for collecting glass, it was probably 13 years ago when I bought a cream and sugar set in cobalt blue. I was attracted to this at an antique mall while on a trip to Ontario with my husband. And that was because my mother always liked to collect odds and ends of cobalt glass. And one piece she had that I always liked the shape and color of was the creamer at the front of this picture. She would refer to this as a piece of depression glass. Through some digging, I discovered this was the chevron pattern, and I discovered that others admired the Art Deco lines as well. I've always been a fan of Art Deco design styles. This led to a small but growing collection of cobalt depression glass, which in Calgary, where we lived at the time, was hard to come by. So I supplemented it with old cobalt blue bottles that I found at the neighborhood thrift store. Uh, moving to Edmonton in 2011, we had a lot more options for finding vintage things. As Edmonton is a bit older than Calgary and has more of an artsy vibe and is home to more vintage and thrift stores. So my collections, along with my knowledge of depression and utilitarian post-war glass has grown. Uh, as mentioned, I now have over a thousand pieces and a myriad of colors and designs, but my favorites are still the blues. In 2012, I inherited a piece with a strong family connection, a modern tone pattern cobalt plate that was owned by my great grandmother in the 1930s. So that brings us to today. When I was trying to think of a topic to share with you, I was aiming to bring together three things. A topic that would allow me to share some things specifically related to Canadian glass, since this is glass facts. Something that would be connected to my collections of blue glassware and something I could dig my teeth into, learn more about, and that would be interesting. So the topic that checked all these boxes and resonated was the opaque blue glassware, specifically that of the depression and post-World War II era. Probably the most common term used for this, as I mentioned, is Delphite, and maybe a bit less well-known is the term Shalane. But where did these terms come from? What do we mean when we use these terms? What else is out there that can be confused with these? And how are they connected to depression and post-war glass in Canada? This is what we'll find out a little bit more about today. So let's start with Delphite. Delphite is probably what is today the most well-known of the blue opaques of the Depression and post-war era. However sought after today, though, among the big American Depression era glass producers, it was in production, it seems, for only a short time around 1937. Where did it come from? Well, Depression glass is, of course, usually thought of as the transparent, colored, low-quality glass that started being made in the later 1920s and became popular during the economic lean times of the Great Depression. But even during the Depression years, the popularity of transparent colored glass started to wane past the middle of the 30s. A lot of companies were shifting production to clear or crystal versions of popular patterns. But in other cases, it was at a period of experimentation. Opalescent and translucent glass that looked more like fine china was one experiment, and mixing white glass with colors was another. Jeanette's experiment with mixing blue and white glass led to some examples of what they called Delphite evidently spelled with an F rather than a PH as we usually see it today. This was as a complement to their popular white glass and green mix called jadeite. Evidently, delphite wasn't quite as popular at the time as jadeite was made in much larger quantities and over more production years. 
The legacy of this experiment are examples of Delphite in Jeanette kitchen glass. And like the example here, Delphite in popular depression glass patterns like cherry blossom. Here you can see more examples of Jeanette's Delphite. On the right are sherbets in the Doric pattern from my collection. And on the left, an example of kitchen glass made by Jeanette, not from my collection, but maybe someday. One thing you might be asking yourself about now is where did this term Delphite originate? Well, Delft is a city in Holland that is known as the center of production for a distinctive blue and white pottery. Delftware, or also known as Delft blue, has become a general term for Dutch tin glazed earthenware. The term actually covers wares with other colors besides blue and white, and not just those made in Delft itself. It is also used for similar pottery, such as English Delftware, which is a tin glazed pottery made in the British Isles between about 1550 and the late 18th century. Delftware is made with a white glaze and usually decorated with metal oxides. In particular, the cobalt oxide that gives it that distinctive blue color. Delftware includes pottery objects of all descriptions, such as plates, vases, figurines, and other ornamental forms and tiles. The start of the style was around 1600, and the most highly regarded period of production in Holland was from about 1640 to 1740, but Delftware continues to be produced. Delft is believed to have been made based on imported Chinese porcelain of the 17th century, as the city was the home port of the Dutch East India Company. Okay, so another question you might have is, if Jeanette Glass was the originator of Delphite with an F, are there times when it's not Delphite with an F? In other words, when is Delphite not Delphite? One of the answers to this riddle is when it's McKee glass. McKee also produced a very similar color of glass, also used in kitchenware and inexpensive press glass servingware of the 1930s. They named it powder blue. It dates also from about 1936. You can see this floral design serving bowl with handles from my collection. It has the MCK circle stamped logo on the bottom. Some folks say that McKee's version was a tad brighter, more of a green tinge and less of a grayish tone. From my experience, when you put them side by side on the table though, it's hard to see a difference. So another question you might have is which was first, McKee or Jeanette? Well, we may never know. The factories were direct competitors, both located in the small Pennsylvania town of Jeanette, and they drew from a common pool of workers. Some worked at one factory for a time and then switched across to the other. In Delphite and in other cases, it seems like a lot of glass making secrets were swapped between factories along with their workers. Like Jeanette, competitor McKee experimented with other opaque glass for their kitchenwares of the 1930s. McKee's Seville Yellow, an opaque pale yellow glass and Skokie green and opaque green similar to jadeite, as well as French ivory and opaque off-white, came out in 1931, 1931, and 1933, respectively. A color of opaque robin's egg blue also came out in 1930, just a tad earlier. McKee called it Chalane blue. In a similar way to Jeanette's opaque blue is the origins for the widespread use of the term Delphite, McKee's opaque robin's egg blue color is the origin for the term Chalane and has been used by other collector, by collectors and dealers in a similar fashion for other companies' glass. It is sometimes also called Chalene, spelled without the second A. So we found out earlier where the term Delphite originated, but where did the term Chalane come from? Well, it's not entirely clear where McKee got the name, but one theory is that it may have come from the name of a similarly colored bright blue mineral called chalcanthite. Chalcanthite is very rare and most is made synthetically using copper sulfate solution. Chalcanthite is only found naturally inside dry caves and arid regions kept away from moisture. The name is from the Greek meaning copper flower. It describes the curved and flowering formations of the stone. The stone comes in dark blue, light blue, green blue, and green colors, and it can be transparent to translucent. Copper sulfate solutions like chalcanthite are poisonous, so proper caution must be used when handling the mineral. It's unlikely the actual mineral was used in the glass making of chalane, but it's quite possible that copper was used as an ingredient in the glass. Interestingly, a transparent turquoise glass called Ultramarine was launched by McKee's competitor, Jeanette Glass in 1937-38 in that same experimental period as Delphite. Was there a link between the robin's egg, sometimes approaching turquoise blue color Chalane by McKee, by McKee from 1930 and the ultramarine by Jeanette a few years later? Again, we may never know. 
Okay, with the origins of Shalane and Delphite out of the way, let's move on to the Canadian part of the story. Among collectors of Delphite glass from the 1930s and post-war era today, it's quite well known by our neighbours to the south that Canada has a not-so-secret stash of Delphite glass. The top photo was a view of the REL glass plant published in the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Journal in May 1944. During World War II, Research Enterprises Limited, REL, operated at an industrial site in the Leaside area of Toronto. It was a crown corporation that built electronics and optical instruments during World War II, including glass lenses for military headlamps, binoculars, and optical equipment for tanks. After the war operations were wound down, REL and the optical plant was sold to the U.S. conglomerate Corning Glass Company for $150,000 on October 2, 1945. Corning recognized the rise of post-war consumerism and suburbanization and decided to open a branch plant to produce consumer glass housewares for the burgeoning Canadian market. Corning appears to have operated the plant at 135 Vanderhoof Avenue until 1954. What was to be produced there though, had its origins in US glass producer Macbeth Evans that was very active during the depression years. This part of the story is also connected to that experimentation among glassmakers mentioned earlier as the trend of tr colored translucent glass was waning during the later 1930s. Macbeth Evans designed lines to compete with fine chinaware using cheaper machine made glass making. This had the distinctive pie crust edge markings on the plates and the fork pattern on cups. This is easiest to see here with the image on the left, the white cup with the blue fired on color. Chinex was made from the late 1930s to early 1940s in ivory and with applied decal decorations like this plate in the center photo. Cremex Bordet was made in white glass with fired on pastel color border edges, including in a pale blue shade, very similar to Delphite. Cups had the color on the entire outer surface. Bordet was also made from the late 1930s to early 40s. And there is some suggestion that a few rare pieces fully in Delphite may have been made in the US Macbeth Evans plant. Overall, these patterns are quite scarce and command high prices. It is difficult to put together a large collection to set a table. So you might be wondering how we get from Macbeth Evans, a lamp glass maker and later maker of glass dinnerware in Charlevoix, Pennsylvania, outside Pittsburgh, to Pyrex Canada in Leaside, Toronto. Well, in 1936, U.S. conglomerate Corning Glassworks bought out McKee Glass, and it became the Macbeth Evans division of Corning Glass. And as I mentioned, it was Corning Glass that had purchased the REL plant in Leaside in 1945. It seems quite clear that the Macbeth Evans molds were repurposed for use in the new Canadian plant starting in 1946, and are the origins, perhaps with some modifications, for at least two of the three main lines. All three of the main Pyrex Canada opaque glass lines from the late 40s to mid 50s took cues from the opaque Macbeth Evans patterns. This included Corex in a slightly off white color, evidently a take on Cremex and Chinex, the blue Delphite, which had the pie crust edge and what appeared to be a new pattern called Crown in a robin's egg chalane blue color. I've discovered a way to get noticed in the US depression and post war glass groups online is to post pictures of Pyrex Canada's line. They are so rare south of the border that you'll get lots of interest, even ogling and envy. The robin's egg blue color on the left here in particular seems to inspire awe. So let's explore each of the Canadian entries in the blue opaques in a bit more depth. First, the pattern that is called Delphi or pie crust by collectors. It was named for the distinctive fork-like marks that ring the borders of most pieces in this pattern. You can see here in the image that pieces originally came with paper labels, though I've never seen one. This image is from an online article about Canadian depression glass. In addition to that though, Pyrex Canada's glass is very helpfully marked on the bottom of all pieces with a round mark indicating made in Canada. Two of the three patterns also say Pyrex in large, large letters, while the opaque white pattern is named Corex rather than the name Pyrex. Pyrex came in a full line of dinnerware, including a large chop plate or salver for serving that today doubles as a large, larger sized dinner plate, a nine inch dinner plate, side plates for salad and slightly smaller ones used as plates for the footed sherbet dishes, low rim soup bowls, a large barrier vegetable serving bowl, cups and saucers, creamer and sugar bowl, individual sized berry bowls, which could also be used for cereal, as well as a larger sized soup bowl. There is also a 22 ounce milk sized pitcher, which is footed and is perhaps the most impressive piece of pie crust for showing off the pattern's distinctive markings. 
as you can see here in the photo uh, of the piece from my collection. Quite rare, there is also a flat bottomed mug with what's known as the pistol grip handle. It's so rare that it's difficult to even find a photo of one online to be able to show you. While most pieces have the distinctive pie crust fork mark edging and are round in profile, some pieces like the sherbet, sugar bowl, and creamer in the top right photo here have a tulip shaped convex rim appearing a bit low and squat compared to other pieces in the pattern and are lined with an interesting dot dash pattern. These are also clearly borrowed molds from Macbeth Evans from the 1930s, as you can see in the inset photo of the Cremax with the same shape at the right here. The bottom of plates and saucers of these lines have a repeated concentric circle pattern, which appears to have been borrowed again from cousin glassmaker Macbeth Evans, specifically from the pattern Petalware made from about 1930 to 1940. And you can see the bottom right image here for a comparison, high crest on the left and pedal wear at the top and on the right. Okay, now on to the other Canadian entry in a Chalain blue color, a bit paler than the original Chalain from McKee, but still a nice robin's egg bluish turquoise color, we have the pattern crown. Plates in this pattern have a three-pointed crown shape, alternating with the pie crust effect around the edge. Cups in the creamer and the sugar bowl, as you can see here, have, a have an elongated shield design repeated along the outside of the pieces. Crown is more scarce than even Pyrex Delphite pie crust, and the color is quite appealing and sought after, particularly right now as it goes with the popular mid-century modern look. This, uh, as an example, this stack of four luncheon plates, the image in the middle here, comes from online seller Etsy and was selling for $200 Canadian as of mid-February. Crown seems to have come in some of the same core pieces as pie crust delphites, though we have cups and saucers, creamer and sugar bowl, a few different sizes of plates and three kinds of bowls. But there were less pieces overall and it seems to have been the serving pieces that were missing. So no large vegetable serving bowl and no milk pitcher. Also, there was a sherbet sized plate, but no sherbet to go with it. So the small plate was probably meant as a side plate. This line seems to have been sold more as a luncheon and breakfast set rather than for use at dinner. There's also the rare flat bottomed mug with the pistol grip handle and crown. In this case, I recently found an example at a shop here in Edmonton, so I have the picture to show. Interestingly, the cups and sugar bowl and creamer in the crown have more delicate handles and are smaller than pie crust. Some of the pieces like the creamer and sugar are also flat bottomed and don't have the foot and have a concave rather than convex rim. Okay, so now that we got the Canadian content in, uh, you can't talk about the blue opaques of the depression and post-war years without speaking about a few other colors and lines that are similarly desired by collectors and sometimes mistaken. Oftentimes these lines also get called Delphite on collectors' websites and in particular in online sales listings. We'll call these the friends. Perhaps the most frequently encountered Delphite friend is the, is the azurite color made by Anchor Hawking as part of their Fire King line. This was a color rather than distinctly associated with a pattern. It was used for the swirl pattern as well as for the square shaped charm line, both seen here from my collection. This color can be distinguished from other Delphites or Chalanes by its very, very pale bluish gray color. Depending on the light, it can look gray or almost off white. It's actually quite difficult to photograph and I really feel its blue shade is best appreciated in person. Again from Anchor Hawking Glass and part of Fire King is a successor to Azurite called Turquoise Blue. This was a color made in several patterns. Turquoise Blue was considered dinnerware, but it was also mostly marked as ovenware so it could be used as heat safe. Uh, it came in a lot of utilitarian kitchenware such as mixing bowls, serving plates, and even thicker restaurant ware. Turquoise Blue is quite sought after and doesn't appear that it was very common in Canada. It is possible to find a piece in a thrift store, but it's mostly found in antique stores and is marketed along with today's popular mid-century modern decor. While it is called turquoise blue, it is more a distinctively blue shade than Chalane with less green tones. It's not as periwinkle blue as Delphite and much darker than Azurite. Perhaps the second cousin to Pyrex Canada's Delphite dinnerware line from the 40s is the US Pyrex version of Delphite. This line wasn't nearly as wide ranging as pie crust and came only in serving pieces and ovenware that are the same color and even stamped with pi the Pyrex name on the bottom, but say made in USA instead of Canada. 
They were made in the early 60s as a promotional pattern and used the marketing name Bluebell in the States. They are quite scarce and very desirable and hence command high prices online. This particular dish on the left was listed as of mid-February uh, for one of the lower prices I can find, that being $65. Okay, now I want to talk about some that are not blue opaque depression in post-war years, but can sometimes be mistaken for them. Oftentimes you will see the name Delphite used by dealers or in online sales listings. I'm calling these the confusing cousins. As a broad category, there are many EAPG opaque blues that may be mistaken for Delphite or Shalane. Because of the popularity of the opaque blues, the Delphite or Chalane name sometimes gets retroactively applied to other blue milk glass. One example is Fenton's Persian Blue. This dates from about 1915, early in Fenton's production. The quality of this glass is a bit rough, which also adds to some of the confusion due to the lesser quality of some production of the De Depression Glass Delphite glass from uh, Jeanette McKee or Pyrex Canada. The creamer and sugar on the left here are fairly new additions to my collection. Also mistaken and often taking the Delphite name is of course our Canadian post-war pattern from Dominion glass, Saguenay. What is perhaps the most prized color of this glass is the fired on blue in the pattern, which usually goes by the name Delphite blue among collectors and online sellers. The pastel shades of the fired on color certainly took advantage of the popularity of the US glass producers line. The Saguenay blue looks very much like Delphite and the Saguenay green looks a lot like Jadeite for instance. This dinnerware dates from the 1940s to early 50s and was made in Southern Ontario. Another confusing cousin is British made blue milk glass. These are all examples of sour beef vitro porcelain from the 1890s to early 1900s. On the left, a uh, Victorian blue, a blue pressed basket shaped bowl made by sour beef, pattern number 1102. In the middle of Victorian blue, uh, bowl at trough made by Power Sour Bee pattern number 1219, and on the right, a Victorian creamer made by Sour Bee pattern number 1430. There is also French made blue milk glass from the late 1800s and early 1900s that can be also mistaken for Delphite or Chalane. On the left, an unknown French production from 1900. This is a blue milk glass base with three key and leaves pattern, and on the right, a French blue milk glass. Uh, vase with corn pattern made by Sars Pottery's pattern number 2222 and shown in, uh, in their 1888 catalog. There is even, even some rarely seen pressed opaque blue glass made in Canada like this late 1890s early 1900s example of maple leaf I found mention of on Instagram. This is also listed as part of a breakfast set in, in the maple leaf pattern in the book Canadian Handbook of Pressed Glass Tableware. Now this one adds some extra confusion because of the name. This color was made by Cambridge Glass and actually predates the more common and perhaps well-known color from Fire King called Azurite that I spoke about earlier. It is quite different than Fire King's Azurite as a deep blue milk glass, sometimes with a white slag line running around the piece. Production was from 1921 to the late 1920s. And on top of this, there are lots of other uh, others from the EAPG period or earlier that might be confused. Uh, in fact, maybe we'll see some today in our show and tell. Quickly, I'd like to speak for a few moments about production methods for achieving these colors. As Marion Clamkin states in the Collector's Guide to Depression Glass, the addition of tin or zinc to glass during production produces an opaque white color. There was a lot of experimentation during the 1930s using this type of glass with other coloring agents to provide the several kinds of opaque glassware that were made to resemble ceramic dishes. Colors were added to the opaque white glass and led to a new type of tableware that was still cheap, but through which one could not see the table underneath the plate. Based on Clamkin, to make the blue color, a darker blue was achieved with cobalt added to the mixture. It is likely that the cobalt glass mixtures were added to the opaque whites to achieve delphite. Paler blues could be achieved with chromium or copper additives. To get aquamarine or teal shades of glass involves iron, and this may have been added with other chemicals to achieve the robin's egg blue of Chalane.
This image of McKee's Chalane shakers helps to show the color differences resulting from slight variations in the glass formula. And of course, with the lean times of the depression, quality and consistency were less important than in other periods of glass making. Slag type white striations in the glass are also common. This is almost typical, I would say, of plates from Pyrex Canada's pie crust pattern on the left. You can also see swirling and striations in, in the flat portions of larger pieces of Jeanette glass, like this cherry blossom serving plate, and both of these are from my collection. Before we end, uh, I wanted to leave a list of some resources if you're interested in learning more about or identifying blue opaque glass. First, some books that I found helpful. Delphite and Jadeite is perhaps the most comprehensive guide out there covering Delphite, although it only provides information on American glassmakers, so there's nothing in there about Pyrex Canada, for instance. The Fire King book here is probably one of the better resources for Anchor Hawking's blue opaque glass from the post-war period. And finally, one of the earlier books from the 1970s on depression glass was a good source of information on the materials and processes used to make blue opaque, opaque glass of the period. Now there is a dearth of information on the Pyrex Canada production that I could find. It would be interesting to research more and perhaps have a dedicated presentation on the history of the Leaside plant and what other production happened there or elsewhere in Canada related to Corning glass. And please do let me know if you are aware of resources. I've also included here a list of other resources, including online articles, blog posts, and YouTube videos that cover information on the opaques and on the blue opaques in particular, most of which I referenced in preparing the presentation. Okay, before we finish and go to questions, uh, I want, also wanted to share a quick video that might help to show uh, variations in the colors a bit more clearly. So as, it's, as I, said, I mentioned, it's quite difficult to capture these in photos. Now, just a note before I press play that you might need to turn up the volume a bit here on your sound as this video isn't as loud as I would have liked. And I will just play it now. Hello everyone, I'm Wesley. Thanks for joining me today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the differences between the blue opaque glasses oh, yeah. of the Depression and post-World War II eras. Because it's sometimes really hard to tell the differences uh, and it's really hard to get photos of them and to understand the differences between some of the blue colors. Um, so I'm just going to hold up a piece of each of these uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what they are. So this is an example from the 1930s uh, of a bowl. This is from the key glass and it's their powder blue color. Uh, I think that was introduced in the very early 1930s. Now a very similar color uh, from a nearby glass company, Jeanette Glass. Um, this is the glass that was called Delphite, uh, and it's probably the origin of the name Delphite, which is applied to lots of different colors of the blue opaque glass. This is sort of the original Delphite Jeanette glass. This is a piece of cherry blossom, which is a popular depression glass pattern. Um, this is also Jeanette glass. This is the Doric pattern, also a popular depression glass pattern that comes in uh, the other colors, the, the transparent depression glass colors that are more typical. Um, so that's Doric, and that's Jeanette glass. And some of the other colors of sort of Delphite blue um, are best seen maybe in the lineup here of sugar bowls that I've got. Um, so let's start with this. This is pie crust. Uh, it's also of often called Delphite. It was made in Canada by Pyrex Canada, a division of the Corning Glass Company in the 1940s and 1950s. Got some other examples of it here. This is a really nice milk pitcher. That is the pie crust pattern from Pyrex Canada. Uh, I also have a side plate. You can really see the pie crust on this, the sort of fork pattern. It looks like the edges of your pie, which gives it its name, of course. And this is a cup and saucer, also by Pyrex Canada in the Pyrex or the pie crust pattern. Um, also, while we're talking about Pyrex Canada, this is also Pyrex Canada, and this is on the sort of turquoise end, or what's sometimes called Chalene glass. Um, this is also by Pyrex Canada, and this is the crown pattern. You can see the, the three-pointed uh, crown on the uh, saucer most. The others have this sort of shield pattern. 
Uh, I also have that this crown in the sugar bowl. And this is stamped with Pyrex made in Canada on it. Uh, similar to that, very similar color, and I'll pull them both up so you can see them. So this is the Pyrex Canada the crown, and this is turquoise blue, which is one of the Fire King lines from Anchor Hawking uh, from the 50s. It's got the Fire King logo on the bottom. Also from Fire King, while we're talking about Fire King, is another color that is often, it's really hard to tell that it's blue sometimes. In some way it looks almost white. This is Azurite. It's one of Anchor Hawking's opaque colors in a very pale blue. This is uh, the pattern Swirl by Anchor Hawking. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about this. This is actually not an opaque blue. This is a clear glass with a fired on color, a uh, painted color. Uh, this is uh, Saguenay, made by Dominion Glass in Canada. Um, it's the name of the pattern. Uh, and this color on it is often called Delphite, I think because of its similarity to the Delphite glass, or the opaque glass. So that is Saguenay. And then one last one here before we go. This is actually much earlier, so this is not uh, opaque glass from the Depression or post-World War II era. This is actually Fenton in an, uh, in a sort of opalescent color, but it looks very similar and might be mistaken for opaque glass. Uh, and this is a very early in Fenton's production from 1915 and is sometimes called Persian blue. So there's that's a little bit more about the opaque blues, uh, and that's all for today. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I'd be pleased to have any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, I'm going to 